90 Day Fiancé Happily Ever After Recap, No Turning Back. When we first caught up with our couples at the beginning of the season, who knew we'd end up in fistfights over chicken wings and downgrades from firehouses? Or secret kids and cancelled weddings? Okay, maybe we did see it coming. But still. It's sort of amazing how much lower these people can go even when they're already so obviously at rock bottom. Paola and Russ. It's a truth universally acknowledged that a woman in possession of dubious reality TV fame and a questionable die job must be in want of a storyline. Sai and Paola's case, that storyline has been the feisty Colombian versus the controlling Oklahoman for three, four? Years now. But last night, Paola struggled with authentic life matters, including the loss of her beloved grandmother, and her questions about fertility. Even though she knew her grandmother was dying, it was still a shock to receive the news that she'd passed. Once again, Paola wishes she were closer to her family so they could comfort one another. Molly and Louis. Molly meets brother Jess out for lunch, and it's time to put all of the cards on the table. Jess reminds us how much he initially liked Louis, despite Louise's smarmy behavior and childish ways. And how disappointed he is that Louise hasn't reached out since escaping to New Jersey. Brother Jess, it's time for a wake-up call, dude. That man is not your homie. Molly tells Jess that Luis isn't who she thought he was. She recently found out, for instance, what Luis was doing on his phone so much and and it was certainly not scrolling through pictures of Molly on her girl's trip in the Dr. Nope. He was of course communicating with multiple side chicks, most of whom are probably scrambling for some sad scrap of quasi fame through Luisa's Instagram account. Molly would like to warn these women not to invite these sloppy leftovers into their lives. Molly should also warn them to remove one, owls, two, Buddhas, and three, devil worshipping candles from their homes. Jess is sad. And oh god, when Uncle Jess cries, we all cry. Can we make him a next bachelor? Like, the TLC version. Harke and Anfisa. Anfisa still doesn't believe Harke is telling the truth about his ex-girlfriend's child not being his.
and why would she believe him? This is the Joker who promised her the world, then handed her a used Chanel bag. Anfisa wants Jorge to do a DNA test and, delusional liar that he is, he agrees, but chances of that ever happening are slim to none. At lunch, Jorge claims it was 11 months after he slept with his ex that she claimed she was pregnant. But Anfisa, Russian spy that she is, knows that Harke's cannabis-saddled memory is never trustworthy. Even when he boldly calls his ex up to arrange a meeting, Anfisa side-eyes the situation. She'll believe this kid isn't his when she sees its eyebrows. Also gold digger that she openly is and Fiza is not happy about the potential child support that whore came out owe his baby mama. He needs to be saving up for her new red bag with her makeup. I feel like it is his child. He knows it, she knows it, says Anfisa. I'm the only one in the dark. Nicole and is in. After lunch and adult questions with Rob Lee, Nicole and is in take her back to his in's home. The car ride is long and only made longer by Nicole molesting his in's shoulder and snapping kissy face selfies the entire way home. Oh my god girl. Calm your tits. After the harrowing ride, Rob Lee arrives safely at his in's family home, where she is greeted warmly by his mom and sister. Tea and snacks are served, which Rob Lee chooses to focus on entirely. She doesn't know WTF else to say. I'm enjoying the snacks, she awkwardly croaks before finally speaking up about her concerns. As in translates, loosely, that his mother doesn't want Rob Lee to worry about Nicole. They will take care of her. They will feed and water her daily henceforth. Nicole just inanely smiles, thrilled that everyone is bending to her will, and that the mothers-in-law don't speak the same language. But Nicole, who barely speaks one language, was apparently trusted to gather all of the necessary paperwork for her Moroccan marriage license. Wah ha 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 ha. Oh, I needed that laugh. Okay, so at the licensing office, Nicole finds out that she didn't bring an original copy of her police record, which is needed for the judge to sign off. Azin's relief is palpable, but he plays the bummed out groom with a plum. Oh my god, says Azin, seeing his green card virtually disappear before his eyes. Looks like these two lovebirds won't be able to get married in 10 days after all. Good thing he has, like, six other women around the globe on the hoop to fund his gym membership fees.
but wait Nicole's father and other family members are coming over for the wedding in just a few days. Could they not bring the original document? What is going on? Okay, Nicole says it would take a few weeks to get the document verified. But and are we really going to trust on matters of legal paperwork? Or even a McDonald's drive through order? No. No, we are not. Annie and David. When you get downgraded from a firehouse to a warehouse, you know the American dream is really working its magic in your life. But somehow Annie refuses to believe that her life happiness will be fulfilled by the steps David is taking and which is to say, none at all. Except if we count borrow money from friend until almost homeless, then wind to family members as a super solid plan. Here's the deal, Chris, remember him? David's human ATM? Husband of Nikki, the only normal one? Has sold the firehouse and needs Annie and David to move out stat. He tells David on the phone that he's got only a few days to find a new place and, since Chris still can't quit him, he offers David a new place to stay, the warehouse apartment. No, it's not the title of this summer's newest horror flick. But it is just as fucking scary. David tells Annie the news over dinner, and her face could not be more stank if she shoved two full cloves of garlic up her nostrils. She can't believe she's deigned to live in a firehouse, only to be tossed out for even worse conditions. The dreams of two water buffalo back home grazing lazily next to her family hut must be looking pretty sweet right about now. Field trip. David takes Annie to visit the warehouse, which is run by a very chipper young lad who will be 100 more successful in life than David because he works. David turns his nose up at the idea of doing any kind of labor in this storage facility because he is so overqualified. I didn't get a master's degree to work in a warehouse. Scoffs David, the heavyweight champion of pathetic losers. But he did apparently get a master's degree to live in an abandoned space above a warehouse that has no stove, no hot water, and windows that don't open. Maybe someone from that firehouse will be making a visit to this space soon isn't that a hazard? Ooh full circle moment. I cannot take a shower in two minutes. Yells Annie when she hears about the hot water shortage. But it's really when she sees the apartment which looks like the abandoned set of the office, but more depressing that she loses her shit.
Annie draws her line, she will not allow David to drag her here, the third location, that is, where the murder victim definitely bites it.